father's father came to Salem in 1889. He had gone to law school in Canada in Toronto and came with his new bride and set, settled in Salem. Uh, he had, uh, he and my grandmother on my father's side had five children, three boys and two girls, and they all were lawyers, as it turned out. Uh, always troubled my mother because 18, 1889 is somewhat pioneer state, but my mother's family that came from uh, Pennsylvania, I think, uh, and Missouri settled in uh, La Grande, around La Grande in Union, and they came and the, her four fathers and mothers came uh, in early 1850s, so she is the real pioneer of the family, and it always rankled her a little bit when my father claimed the, well, he never did, but others. So I, my father and uh, was born here in town, my mother was born in Union, and uh, we, uh, I was born here in 1934, and uh, my wife was born a year later here in town. And uh, so I grew up and I went to Bush School, the old one they just tore down, and uh, then uh, Leslie Junior High School, which is on Howard Street, and then Salem High. And it was so long ago, it was the only high school in Salem at the time. It's now North Salem, but it, it was an old school. It is now an old school, a good school. Um, so growing up in Salem was quite a quite a thrill. I uh, I can remember some points. Uh, 1940, I rode in the uh, Salem Centennial Parade uh, on uh, a float with gladiolas. I don't care for them since then. And I was six years old, and I rode on the Wilkie McNary float because, as you know, uh, Charles McNary, who had been a U.S. senator, in fact, was on this court for a period of time, and then was defeated when he ran for the first time in 1914 by a circuit judge by the name of Benson from Klamath Falls after about three statewide recounts, and I think the margin was like three votes. And then he ran in 16, 1916 for the U.S. Senate and served until he died in office in 1942. But uh, in 1940, he was chosen as the vice presidential candidate to go along with Wendell Wilkie. And of course, they got trounced by F Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Um, so Salem was a great place to gr grow up, uh, and uh, then uh, my cousins, because of the brothers and, and sisters for my father, my cousins were all kind of around Salem. In fact, they lived within a mile and a half of me, except for one family that lived in the Dalles. So I had a great, great childhood, and um, I, had, I was an only child, which usually is easily discerned. Um, and. Uh, I had a wonderful mother and father, and uh, my early days in Salem were very pleasant. My father uh, made me promise I wouldn't be a lawyer. So I immediately set out to break that promise. Uh, I think, I never asked him about it, but I think he did that because being a third generation uh, with the two preceding generations, pretty much all lawyers, I think he felt there might be some added pressure on me to be a lawyer whether I wanted to be a lawyer or not. And I can assure you, if you don't like lawyering, don't go into that career field. And uh, so I, I did consider, when I went away to college at Stanford, um, I considered some other careers. I worked in the insurance industry uh, for a while, while in school, very little time. and. Uh, then I went into the Air Force because I was an ROTC commissioned officer. I went in the Air Force. I considered staying in the Air Force as a career officer and because uh, I had a great job flying jets and uh, other aircraft. Uh, but I ultimately decided I really wanted to be a lawyer, so I came home. So I think the answer to your question is where I started. I think I probably had it in the back of my head as soon as I understood what a lawyer was. I had a bad habit. My diction isn't particularly good now, but it was even worse when I was young. And some of the family would be upset because when I said lawyer, it came out kind of like a liar. And uh, I got ribbed for that. I did try to 
make my diction a little more clear. But I, I had the wet-headed wabbit of Elmer Fudd, so I struggled with that. But some say I haven't improved very much. My father had a client, uh, Lee Ierly was his name, and uh, he, was, he worked on and made uh, link trainers, which are a, a trainer that's on the ground, but you use it to learn how to fly in weather. It's enclosed, so you just fly on your instruments. And uh, he also developed uh, carnival rides. If you're familiar with the uh, octopus or the loop loop or any of those, he invented those and manufactured them here out on uh, Airport Road for many years. And he flew. So I had the opportunity to fly with him, and I had admired him. So I thought, well, that might be good. And uh, I felt that it would be a, a challenge. I didn't know that I could do it. I'd never had the controls of an airplane other than sitting as a passenger and with no controls. And so I decided I'd, I was already in ROTC and I'd sign up for an extra year and go to pilot training. And I was accepted and went to uh, first to San Antonio and then on to, uh, uh, which was a mediocre tour, but that's where everybody goes when you go in the Air Force. And then I went to uh, uh, Tucson to live, but we actually flew out of an airport called uh, Marana, which is 26 miles north of Tucson. Wonderful time. And uh, then from there, uh, I uh, was assigned to Laredo, Texas, which is an experience other than the flying I would not want to repeat. And uh, from there, I, because I didn't sign for five years, which was then a requirement, they allowed me to graduate and get my wings, but they sent me off to ground control intercept school in Tyndall, Florida. I'd ask for uh, the West Coast. The Air Force misunderstood me. They thought I meant the West Coast of Korea. So when I graduated, they sent me to Kimpo, K-14. And uh, that was after the war. I'll make my disclaimer. Uh, and uh, I, I went there in 1958. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed flying and did consider, uh, because at that time, the uh, military pay wasn't particularly good, but the airlines were hiring anybody who wanted to leave the Air Force and uh, become an airline pilot. And I thought about that, but I thought, no, I'd try law school, see if I could get through it, and I did. I ran for about everything in school I could run for, um, and uh, I won some, uh, and I lost some. And um, my grandfather had been a state senator, and two uncles had been a state senator, and I'd campaigned for some of the candidates. Uh, I think my first one was Doug McKay. Uh, when he ran and I went, they didn't call it door to door then, but they had little name cards and I went around the neighborhood and stuffed them in screen doors as part of the campaign program. So I had a pretty good idea that I wanted to be in politics. I had no idea whether it would be the legislature or city council or school district, school board, but I'd pretty well decided that at some point I would run for public office. And uh, I did. And Bob Packwood, I, was, I wasn't quite ready. I got out of law school and passed the bar in 1962 and served on a number of community committees. I remember the Salem Planning Commission I served on. And after my first session, I think they, some people would ask me, what was the most difficult issue you had during that time? And I said, sidewalks in Candelaria. And they'd say, well, there wasn't any bill on that. And I said, no, that was my other job. I was on the Planning Commission, and we voted to put sidewalks on Candelaria. As you probably know, Salem doesn't, there are very few sidewalks in Candelaria to this day. But I, I got a lot of calls. I got more calls on that than I think I did on sales tax. But uh, all politics is local, and I found that out in space. Um, but Bob Packwood talked to me, and I said, well, not now, I'll run some other time. And he said, no, there is no good time to run. And I talked to some friends who, Dave Roten, who's uh, been a lifelong friend, and Norma Paulus, who later served in the legislature. And they agreed to help get me elected. And so I decided to run and did. I ran in 1966 and was elected uh, the Republican candidate in the May election and then ran again in November and was elected. And I don't remember the day. It's the, what, the first Monday after the first Tuesday in January of 1967. Well, I think I was impressed by Doug McKay. Uh, I didn't know him well. I was a kid, 
but uh, I, I, he ran a Chevrolet dealership here in town. Um, and uh, he had done very well, I think, in politics and, uh, in, and in business. And then I would have to say my real role model in politics was Mark O. Hatfield, who uh, I followed his career uh, when he was dean of men at Willamette and then uh, ran for the legislature. And then series of elections went from, you know the story, it went from state representative to state senator to secretary of state to governor and then to U.S. senator. Very decent person. I had known him for some time. Uh, had gone to school with Antoinette, uh, his wife, and before she was his wife, and admired her. And uh, so he was kind of, uh, kind of my role model. And uh, he and I are not the same, but uh, I admired him, and I do to this day, as a matter of fact. Um, property taxes, and uh, I think the income tax we got, if I recall correctly, and I may be wrong, of 1929 was called the Real Property Tax Relief Act, and the legislature struggle, struggled with property tax relief uh, ever so long, and uh, that it's now changed, but tax relief is still taxes. Probably always have been an issue in Oregon, maybe everywhere, and I I'm assuming they will continue to be um, a major issue. Uh, education uh, was a significant issue. Uh, we had a creature called basic school support before the initiatives changed how we fund schools. And um, it, um, w the goal was to get up to 50%, but I always thought it was interesting because the legislature had the responsibility of filling the reservoir, but the faucet tap was in the hands of the local school board. Uh, and so no matter how hard you worked and how much water you put in the reservoir, all they had to do was turn the handle and more went out. So we never really reached the magical 50%. And then the whole scheme has changed in how we fund. But it's still an issue, uh, funding education. And it should be, it's a very important task. The environment was important, Oregonians, clear back then. and. Uh, uh, business, to some degree at least, uh, jobs. We knew that jobs fueled our economy, particularly because we're based on the income tax now and then. So income tax requires income, and uh, that's why we get hit so hard when we have high unemployment, because no, no job, no income, no income, no income tax, no income tax, no general fund. Well, uh, let me phrase it this way. People would ask, would would I want to serve in the legislature again? I said, uh, my feeling has been, and I have said, that if I could go back to the time I served, 1967 through 77, I'd do that. Um, I have a competing job right now, but were I to go back. But that was kind of a golden time, I think. Uh, society has changed, not just in Salem or in Oregon, but the whole country has changed. Uh, we're more cynical, I believe, than as, as, a, as a nation. Uh, less trusting or more distrustful of government than we were three dec decades ago. And uh, it's just a, an angrier society, I believe. And uh, it, it wasn't just all peaches and cream back then, but the parties got along reasonably well and, and we enjoyed working together and we were partisan when we needed to be, but it, it wasn't the driving force that made the thing work. So uh, I think the legislature truly reflects the population and I think our population generally is uh, less comfortable with each other than they used to be. My hope would be is that uh, we do a better job, and this I speak particularly with the judicial branch because we are the silent branch, uh, if we do a better job of informing Oregonians what it is we do and what our Constitution uh, requires us to do. For instance, people will frequently write or say they overturned a law because of a mere technicality. Frequently that mere technicality is the Constitution. And to say that, call that a technicality, I think is a, a misunderstanding. And, um, and some very bright people have said that. So I think one of the things for all three branches is we need, I don't think they teach civics anymore. We just need a better understanding of the population, what government is supposed to do and how it operates and their role in it. Uh, that may be a 
Pollyannish on my part, but it, I, think, I think it could turn around, but that's not the direction we're going. The kinds of things that are being said about our current president, President Bush, uh, you wouldn't hear talk like that uh, 40 years ago. And uh, I think that's unfortunate. It's just uh, we carp a lot. When we left the 1973 session, uh, it became aware that the Legislative Administration Committee uh, started, I think, in the late 60s, early 70s, and it kind of took over the continuing operation of the support services for the legislature. And it became obvious that uh, there is a function within, to this day, in the legislature called engrossed and enrolling. And it's a group of people that pull together all the amendments and the bills and it became apparent to those in Legislative Council that uh, we're going to have to double the workforce because the workload of the number of bills and number of amendments was increasing. And so some of us thought, we, the state of Washington was ahead of us in, in, uh, in uh, computerizing, if you will, the, uh, what was therefore done primarily by hand and paste and scissors. Um, and so we wanted to move into a electronic world and uh, the legislature as a body agreed and provided some money and so we started to put together uh, what is now called OLIS, Oregon Legislative Information System. And uh, that uh, was a great risk. Um, we didn't hire, we had no backup, we had no uh, safety net. We just had a job of uh, creating a system from the time the legislature left in 73, came back for a special session on unrelated matters, 74, and approved our change. And by the time we came back in 75, we had OLIS up and running, which then proved to be a model around the country. Uh, I, I don't want to leave any impression that I had anything to do with the design or electronics. I can't even work my VCR, so I wasn't in that. But uh, we did very well, and, and later we, we were able to recoup some of the initial investment by selling our system to other states that thought we had done pretty well. So I'm, I'm, that was a, a good turn. And it's the same committee also put together what I called the Legislative uh, Assembly Media Project. Uh, I thought that was fairly clever to have, its acronym was LAMP. And uh, being in the military, I thrive on acronyms. And uh, so it's now, what, Legislative Assembly Media System, I think. But that was, uh, that was a real adventure because we, we, again, we thought we needed to get information out and the information that was coming out was all commercial. And uh, I learned things like, uh, uh, they, it, and I'd seen it happen, they would take pictures of the floor and then the over voice would tell the viewer what was going on. Well, they might be talking about, the over voice might be talking about death penalty, and they would have a shot of three senators laughing on the floor. And the impression was that during this serious debate about death penalty, uh, it, was, it was funny. Well, it was just a matter of the over voice did not match the activity on the floor. And in fact, I even went to school. John Shepard taught at the University of Oregon in communication, a very fine teacher, and uh, they ran a Friday and Saturday school on dealing with uh, communication with television, and it was very interesting. Well, it, it, it's where the presiding officer wanted to put me, because uh, as you're aware that, uh, or most are aware that, uh, first of all, the majority party gets to make the selection, and usually it's the presiding on speaker or president. And I think when I was in the Senate, they thought it best to keep me busy. Um, because I was not in the majority party. And uh, so I got quite a few, I think I had seven committees the last year I served. Um, some of them I got because I wanted to get them. And I, I had agriculture my first year because Marion County, the county I represented in part, uh, was heavy into agriculture. And I thought, well, that'd be a good place for me to be to represent my constituents. I was on the fish and game committee because the then speaker uh, Monty Montgomery uh, had a good friend that was uh, Wally Martin, I think his name was, from Grants Pass, who was a great hunter and fisherman, so a fisher. And so he thought, well, it'll be a good place, confusing the name. So I got on that committee because I was misidentified. And uh, so I don't know all the motivating, but I, I enjoyed being on committees. I tried not to restrict myself uh, on any particular area. 
but judiciary and education. I don't think I ever served on the tax committee, but uh, they were generally areas with which I had some familiarity. And it's easier when you don't have to start from scratch. I don't really know. I've not, um, whether it's now on the bench or in the legislature, um, I, I don't have a, a notches on my revolver handle. Um, I enjoyed the participation in a variety of things. There are things that uh, I think, and I'm probably missing some, but uh, participation in the beach bill, uh, the bottle bill, and I first time uh, I voted no on the bottle bill, and then it, I moved over to the Senate, and in 71 I voted aye, and uh, I think it's a good bill, was a good bill, good law. And the beach bill was kind of fun. When I was in law school, I kind of studied the, the uh, Oregon-Washington Compact up until, oh, late 50s, early 60s, the boundary between Oregon and Washington was mid-channel of the main channel of the Columbia River. And then once the Columbia River took a big run north and it came all over what they call meets and bounds or uh, survey uh, measurement. And because they were building so many dams and they were having workers' comp, I'm told, workers' comp claims, they didn't know whether they were, it depended which way the, how far the river moved north or south as to whether you were in Oregon or Washington. So they decided to survey the main channel as it was in the 50s, and then by putting down survey calls, then that became, and is today, the boundary between Oregon and Washington. Oddly enough, the legislature never changed the county boundary uh, in the, or at least they haven't, I don't think they have. So the county's northern boundary in Oregon is still the main channel. So you may, I think, you can literally be in Oregon and not be in a county, and you can be in a county that really is now in Washington. Uh, I haven't followed that up, and uh, no one's interested particularly. But that came to help me when we had House Bill 1601, which was the Beach Bill. Because we started um, with, um, uh, well, defining what the beach was, but it was, uh, vegetation became a very important part. And for some time, that was where, when the vegetation ended, then uh, the rest of it was beach. And of course, Oz West had earlier declared in the early part of the last century that uh, wet sands were state highways, and so those were under the public's ownership. And the beach bill said, no, we're going to go up to some point. The vegetation line was going to be beach property, state property. And uh, the concern was, of course, if you, some could pull up the vegetation, which might be grass, and vegetation's always been an interesting thing along the beach. Uh, to keep the sand dunes down, they planted a lot of grass in the CCC area, I think, to stabilize the dunes. So we learned that you can actually move the vegetation forward or backwards. Calling upon my experience with the survey calls, I suggested that um, and I certainly wasn't the major uh, driver or drafter of the beach bill, that rather than going on the vegetation, we see where the vegetation is or pick a, um, a line, and ultimately the legislature put, picked the 16-foot line. And then they had it surveyed, and that became the demarcation line between the public's beach and the landowner's private property. And if you go over to the Capitol building and look at the picture of Tom McCall, you'll see uh, a, uh, I believe, uh, they're depicting this, uh, not imaginary, but this uh, engineered uh, line, survey line, which was the demarcation because he was a leader on the beach bill. It's the, the, the tall pole with red, red and white uh, and that's what I did when I worked for the highway department. I ran, the, they refer to it in the engineering field as the idiot stick, because usually the lowest person on the totem pole stands there like this as they, it's all done electronically now, but, but that was, that was a lot of fun. That was, we could be creative. And, uh, oh, then um, I, I was chosen to, not initially, but I wound up being on the criminal law commission that uh, rewrote the criminal code. And uh, that was a major task. Started, I think, 68, and uh, we passed the criminal code itself, and then we passed the procedure code, I think, in 
73, and that was a major undertaking, and um, a lot of good people working on it, and I enjoyed that work. There were a number of bills that I, uh, I think helped us go forward. Um, some passed, some didn't. So, but I, I haven't invested much time on uh, what are my, what is my legacy. I don't like that to, uh, designation. And uh, I'd, if there were one, it'd be uh, were there to be a legacy. I hope it would be hard work. But uh, that's for others to judge. I resigned uh, from the legislature, from the Senate, on October 21, 1977, after Bob Straub had appointed me, and uh, was sworn in as a Marion County Circuit Judge in the morning of October tw Monday, October 24th. That was a Friday to Monday. Um, because I'd been a practicing lawyer for 15 years, I was familiar with the system and the law, and so there was not much transition. When people would ask me, was your experience as a trial lawyer the most help when you transition from uh, an attorney, a lawyer, or a legislator into going on the bench, and my answer was no, being a committee chair was the best training I had. And I submit, if you stop to think about it, a judge's role in our court system is more like a committee chair. You have an agenda, docket, uh, you have rules by which you must play, uh, you are supposed to be impartial and fair. Uh, and allow everybody to be heard and uh, not abdicate for either side. And that, to me, was more reminiscent uh, of my days as a committee chair, usually a subcommittee chair. Um, so that was, it was quite natural for me to move on onto the bench. And the first, I got lucky, the first case I had been assigned by then presiding Judge Val Sloper was a mandamus case. And I say I got lucky because I wrote the chapter on mandamus for the pleading and practice, um, continuing legal education volumes for the Oregon State Bar. So that was, I kind of like Briar Rabbit, don't throw me in the briar patch. And that's where I really wanted to be, so I got lucky. So there really wasn't a great transition. We have in, in Oregon, um, cameras in the courtroom. Some states in the federal system will not permit, as you know, uh, cameras to photograph uh, where we're sitting here during a, a uh, court session. But Oregon has had for 20 years or so uh, cameras available in the courtroom. We've had it, I'd say, 20, almost 25 years, we being the Supreme Court. Um, but we do have facilities for, and there's a trial court rule for uh, media in the courtroom. The legislative Assembly media system was a very great help to us uh, in some of our key cases. Uh, I think there was one case that you actually piped back over to the Capitol, digitized it, and it went out on the net. So people could actually sit and watch what we do. Now, one would question how interesting is that? Some have said it's like watching paint dry, and uh, I happen to find it very interesting. Uh, in fact, we worked uh, for some time on a program where uh, we would do as um, it would be like C-SPAN. I, I didn't do anything in the design, but we were willing to operate so that we would be on fairly regularly when we're holding cases. And that attracted me. I thought that the more you see and understand what's going on, uh, the, the uh, better able, even if you're going to vote against the system, you at least you do it on the basis of an intelligent observation of what's going on rather than uh, just conversation. But we're not there yet as far as getting it out into uh, the public. But we will sometime. Court TV has a way of handling it, and so did Judge Wapner. Uh, so two different kinds of judge-type activities. Um, usually, you would need somebody to introduce. Uh, for instance, the way, when we go out into the communities, as both Supreme Court and the Court of Appeals will do, uh, we send runners ahead to front men or women to inform the school, whatever class it is, what the cases are, what the case is about. We send the briefs so they can read them, and then we have oral argument. Now, that's the way to do it, because you do come in on the third reel. And uh, unless you know how the system works and have seen, and you can't watch movies and get any idea on it, uh, or television for that matter, um, then uh, that's the package that would be good, is to have somebody say, uh, from 
whatever system we hitch up with, say the three cases going to be argued in the Supreme Court today are, and give a little history to it. Now you can go on our net if you're that industrious and find out what's going to be argued and get a little bit about what the case is. But um, uh, if you're if we're just catching those who surf on television, then they're not going to invest their time in, in finding out what their background is. So that's, that's a real defect. But we try to, we go out, as I say, the Court of Appeals actually does a better job of packaging our trips out in the community. And that, that's another thing we are trying to do to explain to, so the people get to see us in action. And, uh, uh, and usually we marry up with having lunch with the faculty or the, the students or Rotary or Lions Club or something, and we found it very effective in small doses. I was asked that question at, uh, when we were holding arguments at uh, Western Oregon University uh, a year ago, and uh, they asked what is an activist judge, and my response was, the best I can tell, it's a judge who makes a decision with which you do not agree. That's an activist judge. Uh, it's. Uh, I think it's intended to be pejorative. Um, in most cases, somebody who is active is good, but uh, they picked up on active, and I suppose one would say, well, then I'll be passive, uh, and that's not what they mean. So I am a little troubled by that because it trips off the tongue too easily, particularly in Congress, and uh, I'm not sure the biggest hits the courts have taken is for not taking action. and. That's hard to say how that could be an activist judge if it has anything to do with activity or motion or anything else. So uh, that's a concern for Oregon and all the states, and particularly in the federal system, because uh, they have folks that are very um, outspoken against the federal court system. A corollary, I don't know if it's what people mean, because they never define what they mean by activists. It's a, a label. Um, Another one you hear is that the uh, judges are acting like legislators, uh, many legislators, uh, writing law. Well, to some extent, uh, it's true in a sense that we do write law because our interpretation of what the legislature writes becomes the law, our mean the Supreme Court. Uh, or the Court of Appeals, if we don't take action on, on the case. So there is some truth to it, but uh, I think to a person in our Oregon court system, we're aware that uh, the legislature is the policymaker, as led by the governor or as, as assisted by the governor, but the legislature is the one who makes policy, and we do not. And uh, in fact, I think if you looked over the Oregon reports, which are where we publish our opinions, in the uh, last uh, 23 years or so, the only time you'd see the word policy would be when we're talking about an insurance policy or a uh, board of directors policy or something else. And we try very hard not to make policy. And it's very easy for me, I having served in all three branches, only a little bit in the executive as an engineering aide too, um, for the highway department, then bridge division, uh, and then in the legislature and here, I understand the roles we're supposed to play and our role is not to be a legislature and we try diligently to stay in step with that. And uh, I think that was true when I was a legislator, although I, would, I remember getting quite angry with the Supreme Court from time to time when they would overturn one of the bills I had worked on. Um, so I, I understand uh, the, the tension, and it, the, the whole system is designed to have tension uh, so that we uh, have a balanced government, and, uh, and we do, I think, in Oregon. It comes in two categories. Uh, one, I like the work. I, I liked drafting bills, drafting law. I liked uh, trying to persuade others uh, that my viewpoint was correct. Um, and that was a lot of fun. And of course, that's pretty much what you do on the courts. You write opinions and then try to persuade your colleagues that your position is the correct one. And I like to read, uh, slow reader. Uh, and I like to write, and uh, so both worlds were compatible to my, somewhat to my skills, and uh, I enjoy the work. The other part of it is they're both people activities, and you'd say, well, yeah, maybe the Chief Justice job is people, 
but the other six are uh, monastic, and uh, that's true. Uh, that when I was, the first nine years I was on the court, I was what we call an associate justice, somebody other than the chief justice on the court. We have seven on the court. And I would spend days, I'd only talk to my law clerk or my judicial assistant, my secretary, um, because you, that's what you do. And you come in at 7.30 or 8 and stay till 6, and you read and you write and you think. Fun, but it, uh, it lacked a uh, people side of it. But for the past 14 years, in this position of Chief Justice, you're also the administrative head of the state judicial department. So that in allows me, requires me, to go out and be with the people, and I love it. I love being a circuit court judge because you'd be with the lawyers and the witnesses and the parties and the staff and all this sort of stuff. I knew it was going to be monastic when I came up to Supreme Court. I just didn't have a, an awareness of how monastic it was going to be, and it's pretty quiet. But um, so I happen to like the kind of work. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd love to have been a mechanic, but I'm not mechanical. And uh, uh, when I was small, I, I wanted to be a steam shovel driver. And that shows how old I am because they literally were driven by steam, the earth movers. And uh, now, of course, they're power shovels and backhoes and all that stuff. But that's the kind of work I wanted to have, I wanted to do, because I loved being outdoors and I didn't want to wear a tie. Well, I obviously made a couple bad turns on my way to adulthood. and. Uh, but I've, I've really enjoyed it. It's good work, and, and, and the colleagues I've had in the legislature and on the court have been, I've been very fortunate in whatever group I gather with. I have some really good people to work with, and that's been fun. The human being has a capacity to do atrocious things, and some of them require us to read them and become familiar with what happened. For instance, parental termination cases are extremely difficult because usually the parent is either abused or neglected the child in order for the state to come in and say, we're going to take away your parental rights, which is an ultimate horrible action uh, for anybody to uh, lose their parenting rights to their child, in my view. But um, after reading some of the transcripts in the trial or sitting in the trial and having the testimony of how cruel and how uh, satanic we have a capacity in our in our human beings to react. Those are very painful, and they they haunt me. And uh, but that's part of the job. It's a little less here because I wasn't getting live testimony. Uh, we'd get it in transcripts, and if you get tired of it, you just set it down and do something else for a while. So yeah, there there were parts I didn't like, uh, uh, but for the most part, they they pass. We go on and. And uh, I did a lot of, when I was in the trial court, uh, did a lot of mental hearings. Uh, ORS, ORS chapter 426 is for mental illness and 427 for mental retardation. And because in those days we had the state hospital here and we had Fairview, the uh, uh, certification or the hearings to determine that somebody's mentally ill and will be institutionalized fell on the circuit court judges. And some of those are very sad as well. So yeah, there. It's the cases that sometimes were really troubling. But for the most part, uh, it's, been, it's been good. I had hoped at one time that maybe position myself and be governor, um, but um, the reality, I was practicing with my father and uncle, and uh, my uncle had been a state senator, and uh, that was going fine. And in 74, my father died and uh, my uncle retired the next year, and so I was, uh, there was nobody to cover, as there had been before, and uh, it became obvious to me that I would not be able to continue in the part-time in the legislature. I'd need to find some permanent work. Uh, we had three children, and uh, I felt it necessary to go on, so that kind of interrupted any hope of going into some other, going to Secretary of State or then going up as my my friend Mark Hatfield did. And I'm not sure it could be, be, be done today. It's been tried, but nobody's been very successful. Nobody has matched his ascendance. Um, that was perhaps a, a, a wish I had that never matured. But uh, I'm not sure today it's 
all that neat a job. Uh, my friend Ted Kulongowski is in there and I think doing a good job, but uh, it's tough. It's an angrier crowd out there. First of all, I, before I got in the legislature, most of my time was spent going to law school, going to school and Air Force. and uh, So I hadn't really followed closely exactly how the legislature operated. And in an ideal world, um, one of the remarks I would make would be in an ideal world, if you're right, everybody's going to know it and your bill will pass. And then I found out that about 10 percent of getting a bill passed is being right. And it's, mm -hmm. Maybe the dear, dear Lord will know you're right, but unless you can convince 15 other people in the Senate or 30 other people in the House, you might as well be wrong because your bill isn't going to go anywhere. And uh, that can be disappointing as well. But it's also a challenge, and I've enjoyed that challenge. And the same thing is true to a lesser degree in the court, uh, because uh, although many would not agree, I certainly would, and I think the court would, that we keep politics out of, the, out of our stuff. And politics is a part of the legislature, necessarily, I think. Well, now I'll put my court administrative hat on, uh, we've been working for, I've been working for years to get us out of the ballot title business. Uh, as you know, the legislature has given the courts the referee job of writing, of, of, of reviewing the ballot titles that appear in the ballot, uh, on your ballot, and uh, so that's been a function. Not necessarily because they trust us, but they distrust us least, less than other organizations. And we've been over there trying to get them to let the legislative council uh, do the work because a good hunk of our workload, it used to be, it's diminished now because we have changed the law on what this court's responsibility is on uh, ballot titles. But an inordinate amount of our time was spent on because it was at the front end and you know, you'd have 160 petitions turned in the Secretary of State, they all got a ballot title and not all of them came to us with objections or petitions for review but a goodly number of them did. And so we were spending, I thought, an inordinate amount of time. And uh, we tried to get a change so somebody else would do that kind of work. And we were unsuccessful. But with help from Phil Schradel and the Attorney General, Phil Schradel was the Assistant Attorney General, and uh, Keith Garza, who was the lead staff attorney, they were able to convince the legislature to make some changes. And so uh, it, it has lightened our load we're still in the business, but uh, it's not as nagging as it was for some time. So, yeah, on the administrative side, that we still have some room to improve. I really have been, in the old days I'd say privileged, in common phrase, been blessed to have uh, served with some very fine people. We had an entering class of our party that were members that were first elected in uh, 1966 and served in the 1967 session. And um, they were, um, I think about half of us are still living, but uh, they were a group of 11 or 12 of really very good people. And uh, they, we all became friends. And um, some of them are still lobbying or doing whatever else there is. There was one thing that I thought was, when I was majority leader, our party had 38 representatives and the other party had 22. It was referred to by some as a stomping majority, and we tried to make it democratic with a small d. Um, but uh, the wheel turned, and in my last session in 1977, I was at the other end of the majority minority, same party, but I were out of favor. And so we had six, and the other side had 24. And uh, that was uh, different. Uh, if I had a choice, I would be in the majority. That's more fun, get more things done. Um, but in fact, one time I'd remark that uh, um, it wasn't too bad having only six because Ma Bell had given us a caucus room and uh, when we shut the door, the fan started and light went on. And so, tracking a phone booth, somebody in Klamath Falls heard about us, so they sent a photographer up and took a picture of the six of us crowded in, like the, the idea came because there was, everybody was trying to get, how many college kids could get in a Volkswagen. So there is a picture, it's very dear to me, of the uh, six of us who were of the party and uh, all crowded into the, it's actually more than one phone booth, it's the 
south side on the Senate toward the back, seen those phone booths. And, and we were all state senators at the time, obviously, and it was Vicka T and Tony Meeker and Ken Jernstead and George Wingard and Bob Smith and me. And that was a nice group of people. I was glad to be associated with them then and associated with them now. And uh, Ken is a remarkable person. He a uh, former uh, pilot and uh, flew for Chenault in uh, China before the war really broke out for us. Uh, he was a flying tiger, a remarkable man. And the, all the others are all remarkable people too. So it's fun. Liking to be with people. Um, it's not so important maybe in the job I presently hold, uh, but I think for, for our legislature, if, if you really don't like people, that's probably not the job you uh, seek. Um, and I think that you uh, have to have a pretty good guidance system on what it is, how you're going to react. I remember one of the things I learned was um, my first session in 1967, I tried to figure out what was the what, what would be the best for my constituents, but more importantly, how were they going to like me so I could get reelected? And I found that that's not a very good way to proceed, and uh, because you, you become a, you know, what, a, a wind indicator. I mean, how am I going to vote today? Whatever will serve my interests best, not necessarily my constituents or my county or the state, but what will be, what will be good for me? And I found that would, I figured that would ruin my legislative session anytime. So I'd rather burn out in two years making my, the best decision I can make on the best information I have. And if I get thrown out of office, I'm thrown out. I wouldn't like that, but rather than trying to figure out where the crowd is going and, and get in front of it. And uh, it's the difference between being the commander of a unit and being the guide on bearer. I don't know whether you know the guide on bearer. It's the one with the little flag. If you didn't know how military units march, you might, because he's out front, out to the side, you might think he's actually leading the parade. He's not. He's looking out to the side and staying in front of the parade. And I chose not to be a guide on, guide on bearer. So, uh, and I think that's the right choice. A little risky, I agree. I think you'd have to put the environment at the top. Um, we just live in a, there was a book written in the 60s, I think, called, I uh, oh, shouldn't have brought it up, I couldn't remember it, Eco World, but it's uh, the, the Northern California and Oregon and Washington and Idaho seceded from the United States and set up its own government because we had a different view of how we should shepherd our natural resources and how we deal with our water and our air and everything else. Um, and. Uh, that's part of it. So it's not just Oregon or the Valley. There are beautiful spots all around Oregon. But uh, we've been blessed by uh, a wonderful environment in, in which to grow up. Um, and we've had pretty strong, our settling, our, our immigration has been uh, pretty strong, pretty rugged individuals uh, that work hard to do things and make things grow and, and do well that way. And that's carried on even to our modern immigration. That's made, made us a little different uh, than others. And uh, also we have a kind of a tradition of being individuals. And uh, we try valiantly to do things our way as long as it's within the law and the Constitution. I'm pretty proud of that. Part of this is uh, you know, the independence we have. A show of hands of people that uh, don't have to pump their own gas. But they're, yeah, there are two of us. There are two states, I think, now. Uh, Oregonians, um, and I love it. Just love it. Oregonians, just don't count on Oregonians to go down the same path. They will, I hope, be brave and thoughtful and make a choice and move on that. Obviously, it would depend on the subject we're doing. Uh, frequently, if not constantly, consult both the federal and the state constitutions because that's the framework within which we operate on any law. Uh, so that would be a source. And then the law generally, the reports of the Supreme Court that have been written and uh, others. Um, but that's what I would just call legal research. I'll clump it into that. Other people would be uh, staff. We didn't have much staff uh, back in those days. And then lobbyists were then and now, I think, a great source for information. 
And uh, one of the advantages I've had, having grown up, born and grown up in Salem, there are a whole series of words that are neutral words to me, but for most people they are pejorative. Uh, lobbyist is one. Uh, it, somebody's a lobbyist doesn't tell me anything about the person other than what he does for a living or part-time. But to some, you say, ooh, he's a lobbyist. Ooh, wow, that's not good. Uh, state worker, uh, what, uh, public defender, a variety of other things have, have a cachet, as they say, uh, that is negative. And for me, that's never been true. I've grown up, been one, and uh, so I'm not burdened by that. So I, we would consult with lobbyists, and some are very good, and some are not. And of course, the interesting part about it, in Oregon, under our uh, government in the sunshine programs that came in in 1974, any of us could be lobbyists. Uh, and uh, if you spend enough time, whether you're paid or not, in our system. And uh, so lobbyists were very helpful to me. And then we'd go from time to time to, if it were an agricultural matter, I would go visit with the head of the Department of Agriculture. Or, and we, in those days, we would visit uh, the university. I know I, when I, I think it was in the Senate, I visited, visited Hans Lindy, who was a law professor at the University of Oregon, for a question I had. So we, we were thirsty to get as much information as we could, and people were willing to help us. I assume that's still true. Um, now you have the net, of course, and you can sit at your desk and do wonderful kinds of researches. And, uh, but we, we had quite a bit, but that was, staffing was one of the problems. We were, we were understaffed, frankly, and uh, I think they're doing a better job of it now. I think it is a harder place to govern. Um, and, and I think it, 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 in part, is the, what I mentioned early on was that the cynicism uh, and the lack of understanding and the distrust. Um, uh, I'm from Salem and I'm here to help you. This doesn't ring true. And I don't know that it ever did, but uh, I'm from government and I'm here to help you. Um, I think that's part of it. And as I say, the education component particularly for the courts, but also for us. There's the old story about the person going door to door taking a survey, came up to the householder and said, uh, what is the greatest problem facing America today, uh, ignorance or apathy? And the person said, I don't know, and I don't care. And I think that's what a lot of our country is suffering right now. What they don't know can hurt them, and caring is required. And um, we've lost that, or losing it, and it, it, we need to get that back. So th it is harder to govern now, I think, uh, than it was, and uh, that's too bad. Oh, clearly now it uh, has a huge effect. Um, it didn't have much uh, when I was in the legislature. We've had it, what, since 1906, and... Uh, um, but it, uh, it, it ha has had an effect, obviously, because it, uh, when it was changed so that the, the people generally can have a legislative function, it uh, changed how we operated. But for, I would guess, it was well into the 80s before it uh, became so uh, popular to go to the people with initiatives. And... Uh, that has made a, a great change. And uh, some, maybe for the good, and I think some for the bad. But uh, it certainly has altered how we govern ourselves and, uh, and changed how the legislature can deal with it. And that's, uh, I preferred the older model. Maybe that's because I'm old, but I preferred the older model than uh, the current model. But it has made a change. I think everybody would agree to that. We had the practice, we had the law to do it for decades without much change, but uh, it's been quite active. Well, there used to be an old rule, I think it was a Packwood, Robert Packwood rule, that if you don't like to ask for money, don't run for public office. And I had a slightly twist, a uh, slight twist at that, and that is if you don't like r raising money and you haven't, can't find a friend who's good at raising money, uh, you probably ought not to run. And uh, 
So I, I, I think uh, my advice would be is, is do you want to make the commitment in terms of time? And if you are a married woman or a married man, uh, what kind of support will you get from, because it will be hard on them, the spouses and the children uh, bear a significant load that the legisla leg legislator gets the glory and the f folks at home have to pay the dues. So make sure that you have a, the families with it and, um, and then get put together a good team to do it. And that would be my advice. Now, you know, whether that would work as well today as it did then, there is more emphasis on money, as we all know. Uh, campaigns are very expensive. I set the record in Marion County in uh, that year I ran, and I spent $4,500 uh, to get elected to the House of Representatives. That wasn't the record by much, but usually that uh, folks would spend a lot less than that. But that was a long time ago. Well, I think the ability to um, deal with people, um, to reason with them, um, I think uh, control your emotions so anger doesn't uh, work its way in to a conversation. Um, people skills. Well, as I think in part explained in the Federalist Papers and some of the other documents at the time, it was created to have the, a, a balance of power spread across three uh, entities, the judicial, the legislative, and the executive, and uh, the checks and balances. Um, I think it was designed, I believe, I've read, that it was designed to have this tension, and uh, then after John Marshall completed the loop in Marbury versus Madison, where it was made clear that the U.S. Supreme Court could literally declare unconstitutional actions of the Congress, or activities of the executive, the president that now we work uh, and we uh, have to work with each other and I think it works to the benefit of the people. And uh, Oregon adopted in 1857 when they came to Salem to write an Oregon Constitution, they decided to create the same balanced government. And then it was approved by Congress on February 14th of 1859 and became our Constitution. Well, I don't know how unique it is. Um, uh, I, when I was in the legislature, we would occasionally have national conferences, uh, uh, national conference of state legislatures, I think. They're different because the legislature actually does have a persona. Um, and um, for instance, uh, when I was majority leader in the House, um, in part because we wanted to look at the computer system, uh, I went to the state of Washington. And uh, the position on the sales tax, the Republicans in Oregon were pushing the sales tax, and the Democrats in Oregon, as I, in Washington, as I recall, were pushing the sales tax. And I always found it remarkable that something as fundamental as taxation would change as you went over the Columbia River and uh, by party. Uh, so those dynamics of individuals, and they have a lot of traditions. Oregon has a lot of safeguards that we don't fall into traps uh, in many legislatures as then, I don't know now. Uh, it's, um, you succeed by spreading asphalt. In other words, if you're chair of the highway committee and you get good roads in your county, then you'll be reelected, or so the story goes. So with a strong executive branch, which we've had for a long time, I think, uh, in part because we've had, I think, for the most part, very good governors, uh, the balance, you're not judged by how much asphalt you can lay during your term in the House or Senate, uh, at least I don't believe you are, and that's kind of nice. So we're unique, I think we're, that's not true in other states as I understand it. Uh, and the same thing is true, you can see it in Congress, if you're chair, of, it used to be, it's not so bad now, if you're chair of Ways and Means, uh, you live in a different world because uh, you have such power. And uh, some of that's true still today in Oregon, but uh, we're pretty transparent. I hope to stay that way. I was very grumpy. I didn't like the way the emergency board, is, which is a mini legislator, legislature, when I was serving. And it even got to the point that the regular 
uh, legislature would fund the emergency board without designating, as I recall, without designating the uh, just a pot of money, and then that legislature, and then the emergency board, which was not representative, uh, one person, one vote in any sense, and uh, it was the inside group, and uh, they would make decisions that really should have been made by the whole legislature. Now, part of it could be written off as uh, jealousy, I suppose, because I was never asked to serve on the emergency board, so I was always on the other side of the fence looking in. But I supported um, when uh, Dave Fromar and Hans Lindy, a colleague of mine on the court, um, uh, it wasn't at the time, obviously, but uh, supported the idea that um, the Senate would become a full-time Senate and the House would be uh, part-time as it is now. Uh, that got nowhere. Um, I even considered uh, a unicameral legislature before I was elected uh, that Nebraska has. I thought, well, that'd be pretty good. Then you you'd only have one body and it would cut costs. And uh, then I started looking at some of the legislation that was coming out of a unicameral legislature and decided, no, there is a reason why you have an upper house and a lower house. And uh, so I abandoned that idea. Um, Full-time legislature, um, we may have to go to that, but uh, the whole complexion. When I was first there, uh, everybody assumed that most of the legislators were lawyers. And of course, that was not true. Uh, most of the legislators had a, a uh, agricultural background. I mean, the majority, not most, but a majority. The, the biggest representation of an occupation was ranchers and farmers. Then after the law, the Constitution was changed so that school teachers who are part of the executive branch could also be in the legislature. Then it shifted, and by the time I got there, a large number of, the, I think right behind agriculture was uh, education as the career, and the lawyers have always been uh, relatively few, and there are even fewer there now. Um, and a lot of the people, their whole work is, is the legislature. Uh, and that, that, I'd hate to see us leave the, the part-time legislature. Those are still connected into the community because they're earning their living in the community. But it, it may, time may have come that we're just too much to do and we need to pay them a, a good amount. And, uh, and go that direction. When I first got there, all the, uh, uh, with the exception of the senior officers, speaker, and we, our office was on the floor of the house. And you recall, the, the, the desks were built for people uh, in the 30s, and they're much smaller people than many of the people now. And, uh, it used to be a common practice when you'd pull out the desk, you'd pull it all the way out because they're short, stubby little desk drawers and then the little breadboard. And so it was at least once every session, somebody would pull out, not just the secretaries, it was frequently the legislator, pull it out and then you'd hear this clatter as everything fell to the carpet. Um, and also I couldn't, most of it, many of us couldn't sit under the desk because the cut you off. Uh, your knees wouldn't fit under, so you'd learn how to sit sideways and, or not put your feet under the desk. Uh, but, so we didn't have much of a staff, and I recall that in 67 there were 27 typewriters in uh, the room now, I think it's one of the party's caucus rooms off the floor, and they were all manual, and that's how, how we prepared everything we did. And um, that changed rapidly because uh, the ability to, uh, you know, going into electric typewriters and then into all the computer things uh, changed how we do our work. And we have a stronger legislative council. Uh, we created the legislative revenue staff because we were depending upon the uh, governor's office to uh, give us the figures. Uh, and of course that was an executive branch and we were worried that maybe we couldn't follow it quite as well as we ought to be able to or stay with it, so we created that. So we created a staff and they became very good at advising us on, on the material things, not the political things, but the material things. Dick Iman, who recently passed away and was Speaker of the House, and I, we wanted, we didn't have enough committee rooms. I referred back earlier that we literally had, our offices were on the floor. So we needed hearing rooms because we had a lot of people, not as much as they have now, but we had a number of people who would come and, and had to stand out in the hall. So 
I don't know who had the idea. I did, or Iman did, but one of us had the idea that we would build a, an underground hearing complex under the Waite Fountain, which is the was the well still is the fountain was ugly, but it was the fountain that was looked like a big bathtub that was due west of the the Capitol building. And uh, we would have it excavated and build a series. They even had some drawings on it. Well, that got picked apart, a uh, dungeon and all this sort of stuff. But interestingly enough, that idea survived. And now we have a parking structure in the front for parking. I don't think I'd care to have a meeting in there. It's pretty dank and dark and uh, whatever. But uh, so Jason Bow, who was an extraordinary fine, he and I didn't agree a lot, but he was an extraordinary fine administrator and was president of the Senate. Uh, and uh, I think Phil Lang was uh, Speaker of the House. And the legislature moved. And uh, by the time we left in uh, 1975, they'd agreed to build wings to the Capitol building. And uh, so as we were leaving, they were taking out the Camper Down Elms that were back in the parking lot, or now been moved around the campus. and. Uh, I think it was a Todd Construction Company from Roseburg who got the initial contract. So we left with the old Capitol building in 75 and we came back to the new Capitol building with the new wings in January of 77. Amazing. They were, they were designing, the, I think, the second, third, fourth floor while they were excavating for the first floor. Not revolutionary, but it, it was on a fast track. The Legislative Administration Committee then worked with the architects and the interior design people. So I admit to some of the legislators those horrible colors in the wings that, that they were really good, hot, in uh, 1976 and 77. That I still like burnt orange. That lime green is, was ghastly to begin with, it is, and that purple is horrible. Um, the interesting part about it, and, and as I age, Getting up out of low sitting chairs is really difficult. Uh, and uh, those couches are just horrible. Uh, they're too low. But the thing that's interesting, they have lasted now over 30 years. And there are a lot of pieces of furniture you can buy that wouldn't even last half of that. And maybe that's not good because they're still there and still causing people trouble getting out of the chair. But those horrible colors were just. I didn't vote for it, but uh, I was on the committee. Some of our funerals, Tom McCall's funeral and uh, Bob Straub's funeral, and some of those were, uh, the legislature did itself proud by, uh, well, the, the state did itself proud by honoring those two gentlemen. And uh, so there's some very good times. One I do remember, uh, my uh, youngest son and my wife were up in the gallery when I was in the house. And when Stephen saw me, he said, hi, Dad, it was during a session. And he got thrown out. The sergeant at arms <laughs> went up and <laughs> dragged my red-faced wife and our son out. But somebody else went over and had the privileges of the floor extended to them, so they came and joined me at the desk, So, which was even a bigger thrill for our then four-year-old. And uh, so it's been fun. Well, I was there, uh, Hatfield was, Governor Hatfield left uh, just as I got there. I worked with him in other matters. Um, so I worked with Tom McCall and then uh, Bob Straub. Um, of course, I served with Vic Atia, um, but I was, yes, I, I served under Vic as well because he appointed me to the Supreme Court. And um, then, of course, the other governors, but I didn't serve on them. I was here by that time. So. Yes, a simple answer to the question is yes. I think, I think, think the word bickering comes to your mind that, uh, and we used to have squabbles. That, it's, we're human beings too, even then. And, but I, to me, my memory, that only a small percentage of the bills that were enacted or were acted upon uh, became partisan, and the result of which is that uh, you're free to, for instance, when we had the 38 members of the House on our party, somebody had commented that we were all free to vote our conscience. 
it was an easy part to be a majority leader when you had 38 votes because you didn't have to do any arm twisting. And uh, it would not have been fun to be one of the 22, as I later found out, uh, being a desperate minority. But uh, I, I think it, it, it's, the legislature reflects the society. And uh, there's a lot more bickering going on now, I think, than there was 35 years ago or so. Will that change? I hope so. Um, it has the capacity to change if uh, we get some of the current distractions out of our way and uh, try to put it together. So it was a little, as, as the first President Bush said, it's a kinder and gentler time. It was. But it was nationally that way. It wasn't just Oregon or the legislature. I, we can't claim no credit for it. We would meet with McCall. McCall had uh, Ron Schmidt as his uh, PR person and Ed Westerdahl as his, they now call him chief of staff. Uh, and we were in contact with him uh, constantly and I think we would meet with McCall periodically um, from early on in the session and talk about general issues. And occasionally we'd get a hostile call uh, from the governor's office saying, I want to talk to you folks right now. And uh, we had done something that the governor didn't like and uh, tended to be volatile, which was part of his charm. And uh, so we'd get a dressing down or whatever. And, uh, but we were talking. And the same was true with uh, Bob Straub. And uh, was, I, I'm sure it was true with Vic. And then I kind of got, I, I don't know whether, I'm very fond of Barbara Roberts, but I'm, I'm, one of the things I've heard is that uh, she didn't keep up the, her, her personality is wonderful, she's just, with her people, she's just grand, but she didn't keep up the relationship with the legislature. You may recall she vetoed the legislative budget, and her husband Frank was sitting in the Senate at the time. She did, and it was overridden and went forward. Um, but no, I, th I think that, I'm glad that was brought up, because I think that is something that has changed. Um, and it, but I, I leave a lot wide margin for error because not being in the inner circle, it just doesn't, uh, there may be a lot of conversation going on, but uh, I sense that that is one of the problems. And that's too bad because the governors we've had are, are uh, have, have been, I think, very bright and, and well-meaning and are reasonably good communicators. So it's a shame that they don't communicate. If, that, if that's a fact. Well, the great people with whom I've had the opportunity to work, uh, it's been thrilling. And, uh, and not only the people that are on the court or in the legislature, but the people with whom you work, staff. We've had marvelous staff here, and we had a great staff when I was in the legislature. And uh, so I'd say the, the people are the most memorable part of uh, my service. A lot of it was fun. I, I like real poverty cases, uh, as you, I mentioned earlier, that we don't get many here because the law is pretty well settled on uh, oh, uh, adverse possession and, and uh, contracts for sale of property and this sort of stuff. But there were three of us on the court when I first got here, uh, Bud Lant, who was the Chief Justice, and uh, Bob Campbell, who was another colleague, and I, and we'd all gone to Willamette and we'd all taken real property, but we didn't have the same Year, but we all love cases with real property in it, uh, meets and bounds and surveying monuments and all that sort of stuff. We didn't get many and the joke went around the community, the legal community, if you put a map in it, those three would vote to take the case. It wasn't true, but we had a lot of fun with it. So it, uh, that was a fun experience, but we just don't, we don't get them. Uh, no, um, I'm looking forward to it. I, I, I think I will squander it because I, I retired from, I was on active duty, then the reserve, then the Oregon Air National Guard for a total of 34 and a half years, and that meant that Tuesday nights or weekends or two weeks in the summer were pretty well occupied with the military. And I retired in the end of December 1990, and I got my weekends back and all of a sudden I've squandered them on doing, mowing the lawn and things like that. So I'm sure I'll have, find something to do, but I don't have any particular plan in mind. Uh, we have a system in Oregon, if you, the judge elects to do it, I can increase the cap on my retirement from 65 to 75% of my 
last three years or any three years salary if I promise to give back 35 days, judge days, for five, each year for five years for free. And then I get a higher uh, retirement. And I plan to do that. My main motivation is that it's kind of a glide path. You don't go down and to the office and your keys don't work because they've changed the locks. And uh, uh, so this I will keep in the judging. And I will, we have a tradition not bringing back our retirees. It's a modern tradition. Uh, on the court, so I will do my judging, but not here in Supreme Court. But I have talked to Chief Judge Brewer, and uh, if they'll have me, I'll work over there for a while. And, and we have video programs where we do uh, what's called post-conviction relief cases. And uh, so they, they're situated now in the tax court, the judge and the attorney general, and then the lawyer for the incarcerated person, uh, usually. Uh, is at uh, Snake River over in Ontario or Two Rivers in Hermiston or wherever it may be and uh, conduct hearings on post-conviction. So I'll be doing some of that. Some have encouraged me to go back to the trial court and I'll have to get my, I, I very well may, I haven't made the decision yet. Uh, it's been 23 years since I've been there. and Somebody said, well, I said, I'm worried I can't keep up. and. Uh, they said, oh, it's like riding a bicycle. I'm glad they didn't say we're like riding a horse because I never could ride a horse. Bicycles, yes. Horses, no. It's only for five years, and depending on what the needs are of the court system, you can burn them all in one year. It's not like 170 days or something like that. And uh, then you are totally free. But I'm kind of looking forward to because they'll send you around to the state wherever the need is. And uh, my predecessor had a list of, I think it was 17 things he wanted to do uh, when he retired, and that's probably a good idea, but I don't have a list of 17. I've been doing as I went along, I think. Mm -hmm.